Globus. When we were discussing the different um, breakout sessions for the uh, conference this year, um, I was really interested in doing something on healthcare because if we're talking about a post-COVID scenario, or even a with COVID scenario, healthcare is so essential. It's the master key to getting us to that stage. And so um, I'm really excited to be able to do this uh, panel today. Um, I love doing these panels, but today I'm particularly excited because we have some panelists who are doing some really, really awesome stuff um, in healthcare. And uh, we'll learn a little bit more about that as we go through the, uh, the session today. Um, I prefer not to leave questions to the last 15 minutes, so through the session, if it's okay with the audience, I will throw it open to some questions from the audience, um, and that may take us in various directions, but uh, uh, that'll probably be of, uh, of more interest uh, for, for you. So um, I'd like to first start um, by asking each of the panelists just to give an assessment of COVID on what they are doing. In other words, what has changed as a result of COVID? Is it accelerating some of the stuff they're doing? Are there impediments and challenges that are emerging? Um, and what are the opportunities that we're seeing at the moment? So perhaps, um, Mio, I can uh, throw it. Oh, sorry, well, let's go to Scott. Sorry, I can't, see, I can't actually see you, says Scott. Let's go to, to Scott first. Well, thank you very much for the question, uh, Ross, and thanks to the, the G1 organization. It's uh, certainly a privilege to be able to address the audience today. Um, and uh, yeah, on behalf of, of Illumina, we're, uh, we're certainly pleased to be here. So I think the pandemic um, it has done a lot of really interesting things for the, the next generation sequencing space, the sequencing markets in general. But very tactically, um, we're seeing as you might imagine, many governments around the world realizing that there is a significant need to invest in national virus surveillance programs. These are often uh, not very uh, uh, you know, popular programs to invest in, in times uh, where you don't have a pandemic, which luckily is most of the time. But uh, the need for that kind of global coordination and in-nation coordination has increased dramatically. So we're seeing a significant increase in focus on infectious disease sequencing capabilities in general, um, and also an increase in the realization that the impact of these programs uh, is really important. So to use Japan as an example, because clearly Japan has some uh, significant events coming up, such as the Olympics, I've already been delayed one time, but uh, hopefully uh, will take place next summer. And both the participants and hopefully uh, uh, the audience, if they're allowed to, to uh, be there, will need to feel safe um, and having the, the kind of programs in place to allow the athletes to compete and for the audiences to feel safe uh, will be really important to the success. So testing and tracing and surveillance of the virus uh, will, will be really critical. So that's just one example of, I think, how it's it's had an impact on the way that the world is thinking about utilization of these types of, of technologies. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, Mio, how's it impacting uh, medical note? Okay. Um, so if I can um, answer from the perspective of delivery of healthcare, um, to patients. Um, so as everyone probably knows, um, obviously there was um, a regulatory change in that telemedicine has been allowed. Um, this is still temporary and um, one, one of the major um, topics of um, that you know, the Suga administration is um, discussing is how to make it permanent. But um, even if you have um, regulatory change and also even if you have um, the technology necessary, um, it, I think it was only, it was very difficult to actually have um, the adoption. Um, so um, in terms of digital exchange, uh, transformation, in terms of um, you know, um, getting the adoption of patients and also uh, the physicians and the medical institutions, um, COVID has been acted as like a catalyst mm -hmm. in terms of patients who um, will 
prefer not to go to hospitals or clinics um, for the sake of maybe um, trans, uh, catching the virus and also not to use up um, you know, uh, scarce um, medical resources and the, obviously from the physician side as well. So I think um, COVID has become, um, in terms of changing the, um, the, the way that um, people um, view um, going to clinics as that was always, um, you know, it was always an easy thing to do in Japan. It's very affordable and very available. Also, I think um, most people, as most people in this room, um, healthcare and keeping your health was not a priority for very healthy people. Um, you only think about your health when you become ill. And that's only like once in, you know, 10 years for many people and maybe like once, you know, every year or so. And so healthcare has become a priority. And so people have been now thinking more about how to um, get proper information, reliable information, how to self-medicate. Um, and so these are like new uh, behaviors in terms of how COVID has changed, um, you know, both the, the patient side and also the user side and also the um, supplier side. That, that, that's really interesting and intriguing because one of the big issues with innovation and deregulation is that you have to get so many different parties aligned uh, with the new reality. And in this case, COVID has, has been a, a trigger for that alignment between patients, medical institutions, doctors, drug producers. So in fact, that's a really positive development from COVID. And, and the other thing is how much it's changed the, the, the behavior of the consumer, in other words, the patient or the, 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 the person is looking to uh, access healthcare. Yes, um, if I can just mention, yes, in healthcare, there's so many stakeholders yeah. involved and also um, the healthcare system that is, you know, the, the, it, um, the healthcare system now is, you know, it works. Mm. Um, so it's, it's not about unmet needs. Exactly. That so. yes. exactly. exactly, thanks. Um, Alice, um, you know, I'm really intrigued also about the, the um, intersection between technology and healthcare and how um, healthcare can move from just being a drug treatment-based um, uh, di dynamic to a technology-based treatment. Um, how, how has COVID sort of impacted the work that Microsoft is doing in healthcare? Yeah, it's a great question, Ross. Um, I guess I, I guess I'd start with the um, quote from our CEO Sacha that uh, says, "In we've seen two years worth of digital transformation in two months, and that is only accelerating, right?" So I come at this from a technology point of view, obviously, um, as opposed to many others on the panel, but it is fundamentally uh, changed how I see our work in technology and its place in, in the broader communities in which we work. So again, thinking about it from a technology point of view, we, you know, obviously we've seen tremendous upheaval um, with, the, with the global pandemic and certainly it's not over yet. Um, so we have a lot of ideas and we're talking to customers, nonprofits and governments in a lot of countries around what, what do they see as the, as the sort of challenge as we, as we try to come out of the current pandemic and, and build a more inclusive economic recovery in many places. And technology certainly has a place there. Um, the, the thing we're hearing most around the world and, and you know, which is resonating with us is that there's really two, Three, three very important things, but the first two are around high-speed internet connectivity for everyone, and the pandemic has just highlighted how critical that is. And the second um, is 5G and cloud adoption, right? Those are two just hugely important things that certainly impact healthcare and the delivery. Uh, and then the last one that, you know, we probably may not think about when we think about healthcare, but is super important, especially in Japan, and that is around skilling. So, uh, you know, we talked about sort of the relaxing of restrictions in Japan around telemedicine during the height of the pandemic. 
Um, but what we what we saw in not only Japan, but certainly in Japan, is that the providers are reluctant to use technology, um, even though we know that in a pre-COVID, there's a real shortage of healthcare providers in many areas outside of you know major cities in Japan, certainly. Um, and we know that tel telemedicine can be a lot more efficient way of delivering services from triaging patients all the way through to follow-up care and reduction of readmissions. So it's super important. So the other half of the equation though, in addition to the healthcare providers is that patients, and that there's a real reluctance among patients also to, to adopt uh, something as simple you know, as telemedicine because they're not really comfortable or familiar with technical skills. So we're really super focused on the skilling aspect of this and helping get people a lot more comfortable with technical skills, even some of the most basic ones, to help with that adoption and transformation as we think about, again, coming out of uh, the pandemic. Thanks, Alice. That's a, that's a really interesting point because we've, we've seen this catalyst come across that is triggering these new developments. Um, new technologies such as 5G and that point about 5G and the, the, you know, the, the, the ease that that will make for telemedicine is um, really compelling as well. But there's a skill up issue. People have to be able to use that technology. Um, and that, uh, that I think is a really, really interesting point. Um, sure, your company does a lot of work around influenza and um, diagnosis of influenza. Um, how has uh, COVID impacted the work that you're doing and what do you see in terms of new opportunities? Yeah, thank you, Ross. Uh, we are a medical device um, developing company and we focus on uh, providing uh, the, the methods to uh, diagnose influenza. And that is uh, formally done in through a nasal swab method. That is when you consult a doctor, you know, uh, you get uh, this stick inserted to, through your nose. Yeah, <laughs> it's painful for the patients, that's uh, very sad, but it's also painful and contagious for the healthcare providers because when you insert the stick, you know, the patients uh, have the chance of sneezing or coughing. So there has to be a safer method of uh, diagnosing and uh, we develop an oral camera and use the AI technique to uh, find out the patterns of uh, inflammation within the pharynx. So that would be a safer way to provide a diagnosis. And <laughs> wow, so, so I could be potentially sitting at home and think I've come down with influenza. I could go on my PC, I could show you my throat on my camera, and your technology would, would look at that inflammation and make a judgment as to whether I had influenza or not. Is that yeah, we we're aiming towards that. But for now, you have to have the camera with you. <laughs> so the, the, the interesting topic is that uh, physicians are forced in this COVID-19 situation to become a, a decision, you know? Physician refers from the, the term physical, right? Mm. But we can't uh, be physical. We can't have the physical interactions between doctors and patients. So uh, as Alice and uh, Mio said, you, all the doctors and healthcare providers have to be trained to uh, evolve from a physician to a decision. Mm. Mm. That's awesome, interesting. Um, just as we've gone through and each of these um, panelists has talked about how COVID is impacting them, does anyone in the audience have a question? I can take just one question at that particular stage. Yes. Um, one question, probably to uh, Okayama-san. Um, people are getting worried uh, for this winter when we may have an outbreak of influenza while we are, having COVID, we are also having COVID-19 because the symptoms are similar. And we might be fearful of a large number of com people who might be affected with influenza or possibly COVID-19. So how would the doctors, the physicians or, or home doctors uh, address potentially large number of patients who, who may have a similar symptoms, whether COVID-19 or influenza at the same time in a very large number uh, of scale. Thank you. Uh, this is very uh, important topic to discuss about. And uh, for this winter and the coming winter, the next, uh, all the healthcare providers and the patients as well, uh, we have to work together to uh, change the set point or the cutoff points of referring a doctor. You know, um, since now, uh, until now, or maybe in Japan, 
healthcare cost is very low. So many and many patients want to consult a the doctor, even if they were not painful, but if they were uh, anxious about their health condition. But since the patients are uh, increasing in number and COVID-19 has been preva prevailing, um, we have to change the point to consult a doctor in order to uh, lessen the number of healthcare consultation. So if the patient is anxious about his or her uh, healthcare condition, he or she can uh, call the, the doctor and have telemedicine, but not actually visit the hospital because it's uh, very risky and contagious to go on, on, commute, go on uh, transportation systems. So that could be a one solution. That's interesting. Um, I'd like to turn now to um, sort of the role of data and artificial intelligence in, um, in healthcare. And this is, of course, a very complex and complicated and highly technical um, uh, area. Um, and uh, if you go to the homepage of Scott's company Illumina and you look through, it talks about how Illumina is now able to map the genome at scale. And um, I'm thinking in my mind when I'm reading this, I'm, what's at scale? I mean, is that one person is now 20 people or is it one person is now 1 million people? So I'm going to put Scott um, uh, in a difficult position to just explain to us very in easily understandable terms, how big data and AI relate to um, healthcare. And when you talk about being able to map the genome at scale, what, what sort of numbers are we talking here? Yeah, great question. So for context, the original human genome, the first fully annotated human genome was completed in 2003 or four, I want to say. It took 13 years to complete. It was uh, literally a collaboration around the world, uh, institutions and governments uh, around the globe were, were involved, in, including Japan. It took uh, 13 years to complete, and in today's terms, cost about $5 billion to, to do. Today, uh, you can sequence a whole human genome in a matter of hours for less than $1,000 on one instrument inside one institution. So, uh, you know, in that time, uh, to answer the scale question, we have as a, as a community, but I'm, I'm you know, proud to say that Illumina has been a driving force behind the reduction in cost and the increase in speed and accuracy. Uh, we've been able to, to really increase the capabilities globally to get access to this, this kind of data. So, uh, it has fundamentally changed the way we think of the utilization of this technology in, in all aspects of, of life. As we think back to our uh, original biology class, everything that's living has DNA. So plants, animals, viruses, uh, bacteria, humans, obviously. Uh, and so the amount of research that can now be completed uh, using sequencing as a backbone has scaled dramatically. So Ross, to answer the question, specifically, if we take COVID as an example, while a sequencing assay is not a first line assay for detection, right? That, that will be PCR because of the cost. Um, and you can do that very quickly. You could now sequence literally hundreds of thousands of samples in a very short period of time to confirm, uh, you know, PCR results for something like a, a COVID assay. So the capabilities um, have expanded dramatically, and the use of data and AI then I think go hand in hand. The more data we have as a society, uh, the more we can do with it. So. Again, I think we play a critical role. We have an important opportunity to continue to make this technology more and more accessible and continue to drive down the price. And you know, by definition, I think the lower the price goes, the greater the access to, to this data and the better then you know, companies like my esteemed panelists can take that data and do something really meaningful and life-changing with. 
That's great. Thanks very much. That was, uh, that was very easy to understand. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, when we talk about the issue of data, um, I mean, I guess on the opposite side, you have the issue of um, privacy. Um, and um, uh, Kono-san downstairs, when we were talking about the role of Japan, Global was talking about the split between two different, the democratic open, free available information and the authoritarian control over information, uh, facial screening and things like that. Um, the need for data, the need for um, personal information in order to be able to uh, further improve the contribution that healthcare can make to society. Is there a trade-off there? I mean, um, and 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 how do we see the willingness of people to be a, to 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 give up that personal information? Um, are there fears around misuse of that data? I'd perhaps, um, Alice, um, if I could uh, ask you to comment on that first. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Ross. Um, bef before we jump into the privacy, though, I'll just make a plug to, to follow up on Scott's point to, on the open data aspect of it. You know, AI needs data. You need lots and lots and lots of data and making it available in open data sets to researchers, as he suggested, is one of the keys to making sure that we can really harness and gain the full benefit of all of this data that we're collecting. So I, I did just want to make that point. Um, but on the privacy point, I think, you know, privacy, we see privacy as an issue around the world. It's certainly, we see the EU, you know, with GDPR a couple of years ago, being at the forefront and trying to regulate that. And certainly the example that m is perhaps most sensitive other than financial data for people is patient data. And so I'd say, yes, it's it's something that you always have to think about as you're developing your models. Um, but there are ways to uh, make sh keep patient data secure and yet also train your machine learning models in AI. And so one of the methods, kind of the simplest one is what they call federated learning that lets you, uh, and the best example of that is the one we've seen on the COVID tracing app that probably everybody is familiar with. Um, that, lets, that has the specific patient data residing on the patient's device so that the patient controls that. And then all the data is aggregated and, and the models are trained, you know, separate and apart from the sensitive data that's on the patient's device. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, the, okay, sure, sure. Would you like to add uh, something to that? Yes, uh, data security is very important topic. And, but talking about developing AI, you know, not all the data has to be personalized or uh, mm -hmm. contain uh, personal information. It, it could be anonymized, right? So um, the critical points in developing AI is uh, the volume of data. And before the COVID-19 era, you know, it was a competition between the companies and the countries. So uh, which country would make the AI di uh, pneumonia diagnostic AI first? Is it uh, the US? Is it China? Is it Japan, Korea? And it was like that. Mm -hmm. But aside from the, the many, many devastating things that COVID has brought us, I can at least point out uh, one positive factor that COVID-19 has brought us, and it's that COVID has uh, indicated us that we all are the same residents of this global earth, right? Mm -hmm. So if you talk about uh, developing AI in a, in a, in a GDP uh, talk, you know, it's, it's a national matter. Mm -hmm. But when your concern is not on the economic side, on the, and it's on the healthcare providing side, it's, it's the same, there's this, uh, there's this Chinese company which have developed COVID-19 diagnostic AI in uh, February. That's very quick. And it has come to Japan. It, it got approval in June, and we are uh, fully making the use of it. And we are, you know, it's thankful to China and the company. And so all the countries and companies are collaborating right now to overcome this situation. And this is very, very uh, important factor for all the human beings to uh, not, not only to compete against COVID-19, but this uh, disease and healthcare problem. We have to uh, keep, keep up with this. Mio, um, 
in the work that you do to bring patients and doctors closer together, how do you see this issue as playing out? Um, is it something that patients have concern over, do you think? Will those concerns build or recede? I guess the COVID experience may make people more willing to be uh, more open about their healthcare. Um, yes, as mentioned before, um, uh, people now don't see um, just going to the doctor as something that, that as um, you know um, the only solution. And so we've been seeing a lot of more people um, trying to get um, reliable information online. And um, you know some people call the COVID um, pandemic the infodemic. Mm -hmm where especially in Japan, there were like many people, um, you know, saying that um, you can, um, if you gargle with so-and-so, um, then, um, you know, you, you, you'll be more immune or whatsoever. And so the people are now more um, cognizant of getting the right information, I think. And, um, you know, um, as we talked about um, in, the, in the room, um, you know, um, the, there, there's a huge gap in terms of knowledge between the medical care providers and the patients. And that gap is growing very, very much more, more bigger because of so much um, advancement in, in, the, in, in what you can do in terms of treatment and in terms of diagnostics. Um, you know, and I think now it, it, that's an area where where we want to kind of bridge that gap, um, and that's where internet and technology can take place in in trying to bridge the knowledge gap between um, the, the the care provider and the patient or the user. Coming back to the point that the sort of Alice made about scaling up, it's, it's almost, I can see a future where at school you study how to assist someone with, for instance, a telediagnosis or something like that, that it actually becomes something that people become very um, educated in as part of their normal progression through education. Um, because. Um, as you've pointed out, the, the technology advancements are probably going to be or outstrip the ability of people to use those technologies, at least in a broad sense, at least in a broad sense. Um, I was looking at some figures in preparation for this um, panel and looking at the issue of um, drug development. And the, on, on the average, and these are average figures and generalization, generalizations can be um, difficult, but uh, it now takes about 96 months on average for a new drug to be bought to development. Um, the cost is around about two and a half billion dollars, and that's up from about $150 million in the 1970s. And for clinical trials, we all hear about clinical trials, only about 10% of those are actually successful. And so you know, it's a long run to get a new drug. Um, and um, I'd just like to ask Scott again, what is the potential for, for shrinking that? Um, you know, can 96 months become three months? Or are we going to stuck with the reality of it's still going to take a couple of years to bring new drugs from, um, from uh, sourcing to uh, the, the public? Yeah, uh, I wish I could tell you that I had a high confidence that it would, it would get dramatically shorter. But the, 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 it certainly is not an easy process. But the, my opinion is that the... The time it takes to actually develop the vaccine is, is not that long, but to actually get it approved, to demonstrate efficacy, to demonstrate that it's safe, to figure out how to make these vaccines and deliver these vaccines at scale, those are the things that are really quite challenging. Um, I am not a, an expert in the pharmaceutical business. I do not have a, you know, a background in vaccine development. So I'm, I'm probably not the right person to speak to the specifics. Um, but I do think that the access to new tools like data, like sequencing, certainly has sped up the process. And, uh, and that will continue to, to decrease that, that part of the cycle. But I'm, I'm not sure how much faster 
we can actually make the process of doing clinical trials and enrolling patients. And, you know, those are all of the things that do take a, a lot of time. Um, I certainly am hopeful that we can speed those things up and leveraging tools like machine learning and AI uh, could certainly help. Uh, and that's where maybe uh, uh, Okiyama-san uh, would be better uh, to, to ask about than, than I. Thank you, Scott. Um, I'm not a vaccine specialist as well, but uh, maybe I can share the topic about uh, therapeutic uh, mobile applications. In the United States and in Japan as well, uh, several medical equipments have been approved to have the therapeutic eff effects. And those are not, not drugs, but they are uh, mobile phone applications. You know, you download the software and the software tells you if you, let's say you have diabetes, and you, you take pictures of your, uh, your diets, and it shows the calories maybe, and it, it gives you advice that, oh, maybe you should eat this and this next time. And it does have a radical uh, therapeutical effect, even compared against existing medical uh, uh, drugs. So uh, speaking from the, the points that Scott has made, made um, these kind of application does, doesn't take time to uh, actually uh, produce those applications. You, you, you can just copy the softwares. And as soon as the application is approved, you, you can go to the, do the doctors, and the doctors can see you, and he can prescribe you the medicine, uh, the application, and you can download on the software. So this is one of the methods to shorten the, the, the time to reach to the patients. Does, does that mean that you see a change in the dynamic? Um, as Mio pointed out, most healthy people don't think about their health until they get sick. And so the whole process of you get sick, you go and see a doctor, the doctor gives you some medicine to cure that is really about treatment. Um, as we go through this whole sort of innovation in healthcare, does it move the emphasis from treatment to prevention in a way, in that we're going to have a whole range of new tools, wearables, the, the, the app that you talked about that can help you with your um, diabetes. Is the emphasis going to move more to prevention, do you think? Um, it's a very promising area. Um, and, you know, we have to see, but, um, I, I would like to point out that, um, you know, exercising, we all know that exercising and eating, um, you know, healthily is, it's really good for your health, but many people don't do that. So it, you know, it's, it's not just, um, as I mentioned before, uh, about the availability of those services. It's also how to sort of structure the incentives. Mm -hmm. Um, for example, in Japan, it's still very low cost, very affordable to just get treatment. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, many people will still keep their habits and many people will still refuse to use such apps. So I think it's more, you know, we, we have to think about the overall, like how to, how to um, you know, structure the incentives mm -hmm. properly to be able to have people um, you know, take care of their health. I mean, COVID has started that, but um, we need to kind of, um, you know, strengthen that. It's interesting. Um, I, I didn't want to make this a discussion about vaccine, but um, for, for COVID, but it's sort of the elephant in the room question, where right? <laughs> you, you have to address it. Um, and we've touched a little bit on sort of vaccine development, but um, one of the big issues is even if we get a vaccine, how do we get it to everyone? I was reading somewhere the other day that said it would take 8,747 planes to deliver this vaccine to everyone in the world. Um, and that, that doesn't even take into account, take the, fact into account that the fact that it needs to be refrigerated um, in some cases. Um, sure, you used to be a medical doctor flying around the islands of Okinawa to deliver healthcare services. Perhaps you can give us your view on the logistical challenge of just getting the whole world vaccinated. Forget it whether people want to be or not want to be, but just the logistical challenge. I know that's a big question, but... Yeah, thank you, Ross. 
Uh, this is a very difficult challenge that we are facing. And hmm, aside from the production of the vaccine, let's say if we, we have the vaccine already. So uh, the, the vaccinating, sp vaccinating spot should not be a hospital because in order to get the vaccine, you have to go to the hospital and there are uh, uh, patients with infectious disease in the hospital. That doesn't make sense, right? So you wanna get vaccinated and you go to the hospital and you, you bring back COVID-19. That doesn't make sense. So uh, vaccinating sites should be uh, located in the normal healthy people area you know, like in uh, schools or uh, business sites or in companies. And actually nurses and uh, healthcare practitioners should uh, go to the sites and have the patients or people come to the sites and have the uh, vaccine delivered. So rather than centralize it in healthcare providing institutions, you're really sort of breaking it down to more neighborhood type um, facilities to be able to vaccinate. Is that, is that what you're sort of suggesting? Uh, yes, exactly. That's what's happening in the, the remote islands. You yeah. can't uh, locate uh, hospitals in each, each uh, islands. There are hundreds of islands in Japan mm. geographically. So we have the patients and family come to the other islands where there is a hospital. Mm. So um, the medicine itself is uh, changing its shape, I think. Mm. Mm, wow, uh, I, it just it, it, the, log, the logistical challenges of getting this vaccine to places like rural areas in India or remote parts of Africa or Pacific Islands, and and that is it. It, it just sort of um, you know the development of the vaccine. Everyone seems to be concentrated on, but I'm sure there's a lot of work going on into the logistic side of that as well. Um, we. Um, the, I'd like to turn to just how you think, and, and Mia has touched upon this, people's views of the healthcare industry have changed as a result of COVID. Um, you know, the healthcare industry, we used to do some work at Edelman, is not the most loved industry in the world, <laughs> or it wasn't the most loved industry in the world. And a lot of that comes from issues around pricing um, and, uh, and other stuff. Um, has this pandemic really changed the way that significantly and for the long term in the way that people view healthcare? Scott? <laughs> that is a, that's a difficult question. Yeah. And, <laughs> and frankly, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm qualified to, to comment, you know, I think that every country is different. Uh, certainly as a as an American, uh, but having lived outside of America for a number of years, I can tell you firsthand that the way that different countries perceive different parts of the healthcare sector mm -hmm. is, is is very different and, um, and it varies significantly. my My hope is that out of this pandemic, there will be a renewed realization and uh, understanding and effort that, we, as uh, Dr. Okuyama said, th this is a it's this is a societal thing, right? We, mm. we we cannot tackle a pandemic country by country, state mm. by state. Mm. And my hope is that uh, from this, there will be a renewed realization that we are all one planet. And for us to defeat viruses like this, and for us to really improve human health uh, through technologies like genomics that we, we can't do it individually. We can't do it country by country, and we have to do it as a society. So my hope is that there will be a renewed uh, realization that, that, you know, healthcare uh, as a globe has to improve and has to Im improve together. Um, but that, that is a, that's a big topic to tackle. Yeah. I, I don't know if this is um, correct or not, but I was doing a panel discussion um, uh, a couple of months ago, and one of the panelists was a um, professor from Yale University, and he talked about the fact that the relationship between the size of the COVID virus and the human body is the same as the relationship between one human being on the earth. 
in terms of the size relationship. And so, so the fact that this is sort of, you know, it's an individual problem in a sense, but it's also a societal issue and it's, as, as Scott has pointed out, a global issue. Sorry, Alice, I cut you off there. You were, you were about to say oh, something. That's all right. Um, yeah, I was just going to pick up on Scott's point because it's super related on the global nature. It's also related to your earlier question, Ross, about delivery and transportation of the, the eventual vaccine. And I think part of the big solution there has to be a global one, right? Uh, we have processes in place. We're currently delivering vaccines uh, and uh two very remote areas all over the world, but we do have to have a, a, a global solution and a global cooperation on that delivery. Um, to your specific question on how it's changed healthcare, I just throw in my point of view as an American. I think it's super interesting um, right now, and I'd love to hear the, the view from Japan. Uh, it's the sort of the politicization of it that is uh, so uh, shocking and, and actually very dismaying to a lot of us Americans. Um, so it's not so much that uh, people did mistrust healthcare or professionals, but it has now become so politicized that now they do. So it's not because of COVID, but it's the politicization of the issue in, in my country that has really made it um, really challenging for, for healthcare professionals. You only have to look to see what has happened in the CDC mm. and uh, with Dr. Fauci and even the NIH. It's shocking, but it's amazing how quickly that can happen. So I would really love to hear how in Japan, where you don't have the politicization necessarily that we have here, how that changed the perception of healthcare providers in COVID times. Thanks. Thanks, Alice. Uh, Mia, would you like to... Um. I would like to ask um, uh, Okiyama-san as well, but um, you know, I don't see the politicization in Japan. Maybe perhaps because the death toll and you know the um, you know the um, casualties is not so much um, um, from where I'm seeing. But um, what's changed is um, you know there's so much more. Um, people focusing on the healthcare sector, and you know that's not just um, you know just the healthcare and with what which was enclosed with, um, just in the within the healthcare industry now even you know normal people mm. like me um, is focused on like you know healthcare the healthcare industry and what's going to happen over the next 10 years um, and so more as more people are focused on it then the gaps in the systems what could be improved is also being focused on and that's why there are many more much more people um, you know doing try um, in the startup industry mm -hmm. as well trying to focus on um, fixing mm -hmm. some problems mm -hmm. um, and those problems that people are trying to fix over uh, post-COVID mm -hmm. is much more precise and much more segmented. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's one of the positive um, issues that's going on. Yeah, it actually has changed the people, uh, the way the people in Japan sees the uh, medical industry. And there are two opposite ways. And, and uh, yes, there are some criticisms against uh, healthcare providers, but there are more and more respects to the healthcare providers, in my opinion. Um, I've been keeping uh, receiving messages from my, uh, my former colleagues and uh, my classmates in the university, and yeah, keep up the good work. And yeah, I respect the, all the healthcare providers. Is there anything we can do for you? And this is uh, what Mio has mentioned. This is that uh, a change that is showing um, that healthcare is, is, is an everyday issue. It's not an issue that occurs once in a year or once in 10 years, but it's an everyday concern. It's a healthy concern. It's a good concern to have. And yeah, we, we, we should make the most, most use of this uh, change to uh, develop medicine even more. That's great. I think um, so far the takeaways for me have been that um, the first thing is that in, in, in terms of healthcare, COVID has actually provided a positive catalyst 
Um, you know, we've seen this um, innovation and technological advancement which has been happening, and of course that has been accelerated. But the, the big news is the removal of barriers, that now you have all those stakeholders cooperating, that it's become a societal issue. Um, that, as Shaw pointed out, you know, it's not a country by country economic competition anymore. It's a global um, cooperation issue that we're seeing. And so, on the one hand, you're seeing that great technological innovation um, moving forward at a faster pace, but at the same time, all those barriers that were there um, have also been removed. And so, um, we can look forward to even greater acceleration um, in the future as a result of that. And that we don't hear many things that are positive about COVID, but that's certainly something that is um, positive. Um, I'd now like to turn to the audience and uh, online for um, any questions that they might have for the panelists today. Yes. Uh, my question is uh, related to how to collect reliable information because I struggle to get uh, right information about COVID-19 or so. So uh, I'm curious uh, which website or you know, who should I follow on Twitter. And uh, I'm also curious too about uh, there is, uh, whether there is uh, insider information, you know, which you know, I don't know, but you professional knows. I'm curious about that. Um, actually, I'm your friend, but um, um, uh, um, our company has a COVID uh, site that we have, um, that we have, um, you know, uh, um, we co-write um, with the National Center of Infectious Diseases and also um, the various uh, national institutions. Um, and that's one, sorry, I had to sort of advertise that. Um, but also the, the main sites on, um, for, for the, um, the, the Gakkai, the medical institutions, especially for the infectious, infectious diseases um, is also one thing. And also um, the, uh, the minister, ministry of, uh, no, not that. <laughs> health and yeah um, is also one thing and we we and also some other sites such as medley we, we kind of like make that into um, normal persons um, uh, uh, speak um, there's uh, there's an organization called the Japan Internet Media Association Jima J I M A uh, you can look it up on Google. And there's a guy there called Shimamura-san who used to be a director at TBS. And he spends all day researching news about COVID and identifying false news through third-party backup. So that's a really interesting site to go to as well because they have what was said and what the truth is, what is said and what the truth is. Um, so it's also good to see that the media is addressing this issue of the infodemic. Sho or Scott, would you like to comment on that or and on the issue of insider information that only you guys have? <laughs> Hopefully, yeah, I had uh, insider information. But um, the Tokyo Metropolitan Government has a Twitter, and that is very uh, uh, good to Twitter to follow. Yeah. Scott, the, air, the, the, the issue of, um, uh, I guess, access to information. Any comments from your perspective? Probably uh, not anything great to add. Okay, great. Uh, it, it's disappointing to add on to Alice's comments that it, at least, you know, in, in some countries, we've, we've seen it become increasingly difficult to get good information because it has been politicized. Yeah. Uh, it, it's sad, but I, I would, if it was me, uh, the the advice I would give is make sure that you're you're vetting people that you're following on Twitter. Uh, just because they they say they're an expert doesn't necessarily mean that that's the case. Um, and you know, the vast majority I would say of of government sites have the the latest and, and greatest information. Um, but yeah, it's a it, it's it's a difficult topic. One thing I would like to just point out to is that maybe Japan, in that sense, has been helped by the experience of 311. 
because uh, I know at 3.11, particularly the issue around um, after the Fukushima incident about radiation, and, and, and I was a fool because I, uh, I was running the company at the time, and I read that if you spread iodine on your body, then it would protect you from radiation. And so as a company, we went out and bought these large bottles of iodine in case we would have to ask our employees to paint their bodies before they went home on the train. And of course, it was a complete falsehood. But I think you know, we went through that period where suddenly we all became experts on nuclear technology and becquerels and all sorts of things. And we had that process of sorting out wrong information from right information and listening to experts. So that may have helped us prepare us in a sense in Japan for the experience we're going through now. Um, next question, yes. Ah, sorry. Yeah. Go. <laughs> Ladies first, we'll go for diversity. Thank you very much for all the um, panelists' uh, contributions. I think they're great. Uh, question along the lines of this morning, uh, so the strength of Japan. You know, what's unique about Japan? Mm. The, you know, what, what do we excel in, um, in, you know, kind of in, in the world, if you would? Mm. And COVID, it's a great opportunity, I think. It's a, it's a tragedy in that sense. But also at the same time, it, it is an opportunity where we can share, show something uh, to the world. And I'm trying to figure out what that something is. Okay. And I've been in the health sector, uh, I've been in the pharmaceutical industry for 20 odd years. Uh, so I'm, you know, naturally, you know, coming into the healthcare lens. But, and I still can't figure it out. I'm trying to, you know, see, is, is there anything that Japan did great at um, that can share, that can take that leadership, uh, you know, into the world, uh, maybe in terms mm. of healthcare. Okay, so maybe um, uh, I can throw that to, uh, for an external perspective, Scott, and then an internal perspective, maybe Shaw, just to talk about, um, Scott, from your perspective, um, uh, Illumina being a sort of global organization, what does Japan do especially well that, that is, that is uh, it can boast to the rest of the world, I guess? Yeah, it, a, a good question. So I would point to one particular emerging use of the technology that we generally refer to as population sequencing. So there are lots of countries that are trying to determine the right best way to generate safely, effectively, you know, with privacy concerns, the greatest amount of sequencing data about their population in key areas like oncology. Uh, an organization in the UK called Genomics England started this off several years ago and has really kind of been the, the thought leader. A lot of countries are, are following suit. It's a very complicated process. These are really big projects. And uh, I, I would say that aside from England, uh, nobody is really considered to be leading because they were first. But I've been very impressed with the work still mostly behind the scenes, but there have been public uh, announcements about Japan's effort to do exactly that. So they made an announcement a little over a year ago about a project where the intent is to, uh, to focus on oncology and uh, rare disease and to sequence uh, upwards of 100,000 patients. Um, and so this goes back to the discussion we had earlier about the generation of large volumes of data and what you can do uh, with that data to improve the health of the population. So that really is the motivation for this effort is to improve the, the health and the health care of the Japanese uh, citizens. And the even through this whole COVID pandemic, the, I think, political will to realize that these efforts can be critically important long term, despite the fact that they are complex and will likely uh, you know, be fairly expensive, that the payoff for the population is significant down the road. So I actually think that Japan is well positioned to be one of the world's thought leaders in this area. And we will see that play out over the next, I would say, two to five years as these programs evolve globally. But there is nothing keeping Japan from doing that. So I'm, a, I'm actually very excited about uh, the work that's, uh, th that's going on behind the scenes and that, frankly, I think will start here in earnest in the, in the coming months. So that's very exciting. Wonderful. Sure. 
Yes, uh, emerging, emerging uh, technologies are one point, one important point. And the other uh, speci specialized topic about Japan is that Japan has such high density of population. Japan has uh, 100 million citizens in, in this such small uh, island area. And more than 70% of the island is uh, mount, are mount, mountains and forests. So uh, <coughs> what we can do is that, oh, and besides that, uh, Japanese people love to wear masks, right? <laughs> So, so the point is that we have this uh, geographic uh, characteristics and these uh, habits of uh, Japanese people. So we have to accumulate data and then analyze data. And those two are uh, strong points about Japan. And after that, we have to uh, publish and make public the data, the, the analyzed data to uh, lead the society to compete against COVID. So in a sense, the the resource disadvantage that Japan has being a very crowded mountains, islands, is actually a positive in terms of yes, accumulation yes. of data and uh, information um, for healthcare. That's interesting. One more question, yes. Um, uh, during the plenary, uh, Minister Kono mentioned the abolition of ha uh, Hanko that demonstrate how we are behind in digitalization in the government. But COVID-19 seems to have demonstrated how we are behind in digitalization in the medical sector as well. Hospitals are reporting to the government through facts. Uh, that's a macro level. On the micro level, uh, patient-related information are scattered around uh, various medical institutions. So you don't have a full picture on a per, uh, patient level. What have been the reasons for why we are so behind? And what can be done to accelerate the digitalization in Japan for the medical sector? Maybe for Takaoko-san and Alice. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, so our company has also been involved in um, consulting um, people in the um, uh, house, Zaitaku uh, Iro, which is like the house um, taking care of um, and nursing um, of elderly in at, at home. Um, and we tried to digitalize it, but it was all, it was very difficult because of what Alice mentioned before about the skilling issue. Um, and so, you know, the medical professionals are, you know, very used to, um, you know, faxes and even uh, simple things such as using um, texting messaging, such as, um, you know, um, Slack or whatnot, um, that's also, you know, a hurdle. So the training of the uh, professionals in the industry is one issue. And also we need to um, sort of um, sort out the issues surrounding uh, the medical information. Um, so, so digital information, how, how is that, you know, what is allowed and what is not in this digital era? That's something that really needs to be, um, you know, uh, discussed and also uh, the rules need to be laid out. Interesting. Alice, would you like to uh, add something? Sure. Um, yeah, uh, I guess my first answer is how much time do you have? We, we probably talk about this every day <laughs> at Microsoft Japan. This is probably our number one question. And boy, if I had the answer, we would be uh, in a very different position. But it, it, you're, you're, it's such a great question because it, it gets to the heart of kind of the real challenge. And it's not just in healthcare, as you point out, as the question you point out, it's throughout Japan. And um, I just and skilling is one of the huge issues. We saw it both, you know, when with the lockdown and the emergency declaration, and then even with children being able to take online learning. Right, that was a huge challenge. So it's a huge challenge across the the, the country. Um, I'd say just in terms of uh, healthcare, let's just take one small practical example that is a challenge. I think the latest figure is. The current um, most most hospitals and the government for sure spends the vast majority, like 85% of their budgets, just on maintaining on premises, maintaining their current systems. That doesn't give. That's not for innovation. That's not, that's just to keep everything running. Um, and then you have uh, 
there's kind of a lack of knowledge or skill in enterprises and in healthcare around technology and the benefits of technology, because what they've done is they've outsourced it to, to partners like Fujitsu, Hitachi, NEC, all the big names that you, you can think of. They have kind of handed over responsibility, if you will, to maintaining those systems for them on premises, not in the cloud. Uh, and, and they, and they just keep, kind of along that path, right? It's just, they're, they're paying 85% of their budget just to keep things running and they're giving it all to these, these system integrators, we call them, uh, to do that for them. And so therefore the, the BDMs or business decision makers or CEOs or CIOs, they really don't have the, the knowledge to understand how technology can help them improve you know, both the delivery of service, efficiency, speed, any of that. So that's just one example, but there's lots. Okay, thank you very much, um, Alice. Unfortunately, we've, uh, we've run out of time. Actually, we've gone a little bit over time. Um, everyone, could you please uh, join me in uh, thanking these uh, uh, really impressive uh, panelists that we had today. Thank you, everyone. Globus.